coming. I'm Charles Keegan, I'm the editor of Alliance, and we're delighted to have you all here to uh, discuss uh, the issues arising from our June issue on climate philanthropy, specifically after the Paris Agreement. I'm delighted to be joined by a uh, fellow panelist here, uh, Anna Henshaw from the Oak Foundation, who um, uh, has just been in Geneva on the way back to the US, and it's great to have you here. Joan Carling, who's been at a conference in Denmark that is based in Thailand, and is from the Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact. And Beside me are the Florence, um, Florence Miller from the Environmental Funders Network. You know, it's great to have you here and it's great to have all of you here. Um, obviously we're meeting at a time uh, in the UK of great sadness with the murder of Joe Cox um, and then following on with great uncertainty um, with the referendum. Um, but in some ways it feels appropriate that we're talking about an issue that is even as pressing, even more pressing, and that is the one of climate change. Um, climate philanthropy and what it might be able to do about it. And um, the objectives really for today are to try to understand a little bit more about the Paris Climate Agreement in which uh, 195 states came together to commit to reduce global warming below the two degrees threshold. Um, and then to really move on to look at climate philanthropy, its scale or lack of scale in some cases, um, its focus, where climate philanthropy is focused, and the extent to which what climate philanthropy there is um, can not just be increased but focused on issues around justice and the issues of injustice that um, follow from climate change. I also hope this is an opportunity to form new relationships with colleagues and others uh, so that we can galvanise um, the climate uh, movement and galvanise philanthropy in relation to it. So if we achieve at least some of those objectives, we can leave this room feeling that we're making some kind of contribution to moving the issues forward. Um, what will happen at the moment is presentations from each of our panellists of about 10 to 12 minutes. Um, and then there'll be, as always, with Alliance Breakfast Club opportunities for plenty of questions and answers and interactions, and we'll try to be as discursive and informal as we can be, because I know there's lots of expertise in the room from lots of different places. Um, but before I start um, uh, introducing the, the panellists and, and handing over to them, um, I'll hope you can indulge me just to give a brief introduction about the June issue, the summer 2016 issue, which is focused on climate philanthropy. There should be some on the seats. Um, uh, grab one if, if, if you can see one nearby. And the reason I'm going to present just briefly about that is that our guest editors that work on the edition with the editor are all based in different places, in Nigeria, in um, uh, Boulder, and in New York, and therefore can't be with us. So I just want to uh, uh, just provide some sense of what they brought to the table, who they were, what they brought to the table, and some of the issues that we'll be hearing more about from our speakers. So the guest editors for this edition were Michael Northrop from the Rockefellers Brothers Fund in New York, and then Nemo Bassi from the Global Green Grants Fund. He's a chair of the Global Green Grants Fund based in Benin in Nigeria. And uh, Dr. Terry Odenhall, who is the uh, chief executive of the Global Green Grants Fund. And what they brought is different perspectives on the issue of climate change and climate philanthropy. And what was quite clear is that they had different interpretations of the Paris Agreement, this landmark agreement. To Michael Northrop, um, uh, he argued that this is a, a high watermark, a great opportunity, and no pun intended there, <laughs> a great opportunity to really move forward debates about climate change and really focus sustained attention on the issues. And therefore, for him, the glass was half full. Um, and he talked in the pieces that we worked with him on the games from Paris. For Perry Odenhoa and Nemo Bassi, despite their acknowledgement of many of much of the progress, there was also a, a concern that there were too many gaps that were unfilled and unspoken. And for them, the major gap was a lack of a discourse around climate justice um, and um, uh, the, the voices of some of the marginalised groups, particularly uh, indigenous groups, women in some cases, and young people. And I think it particularly fitting in this edition, we have the perspective from um, one of the leading uh, young climate activists on um, page, uh, I think it's in page uh, 39, um, focusing on what climate philanthropy means for young people. <coughs> We've been talking a lot in the context of Brexit referendum, of the voices of, of young people, and I think the same might be true in relation to climate change, about the effects that, that, that might, might, they might have. There's also in the edition on pages on page 23 a piece by Professor Stefan Ramsdorf, um, who's setting out some of the climate science for anyone who's any doubt about what that means. 
Um, there's some data about climate philanthropy. Uh, only 2% of philanthropy is going to climate change head on at the moment. And there's some information about the Paris Agreement for those that are less familiar with it, and that's on page 26. There's an interview with um, Anna Henshaw and her colleague Florence Tercia from the Oak Foundation on page 29 about their work on the Climate Justice Initiative from WIP, about which you will hear more in a moment. Um, there's two pieces on indigenous people um, uh, and their perceptions of Paris and their needs and their rights um, on pages 40 and 41. And then, perhaps most controversially of all, there's a part three of the magazine is focused um, from page 45 onward on the debate around divestment and investment. Um, uh, alliance, we haven't taken an editorial view, but we have tried to set out some of the different perspectives uh, on it, um, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to hear a bit more about that. So thank you for bearing with me while I just gave a brief overview of what we've done in the summer 2016 edition. And I'm now delighted to introduce Anne Henshaw, who, um, as I say, is at the Oak Foundation, a program officer there, uh, based in the United States, heading its climate justice initiative. And I'm delighted that you can be with us today, and I'll hand over the microphone to you now. Okay. Thank you, Charles. It's, it's really great to be here, and, and uh, thank you for the invitation. really want to congratulate Charles and the Alliance um, team for this special edition. I think it really captures the multiple dimensions of the climate change movement today. Um, and I think the edition, um, as Charles was indicating, reflects the idea that, that Paris in many ways served as a springboard for philanthropic engagement across multiple sectors. Um, specifically, it galvanized, galvanized a much broader base of support and engagement well beyond the environmental community, um, <clears throat> funder community, to one that was equally focused, I thought, on social justice issues. Um, so today I want to focus my remarks on two areas. One is sort of the shifting funding paradigm in climate philanthropy, and second, how the Oak Foundation reflects this shifting um, funding using the Climate Justice Initiative um, and a series of grants we made towards the Paris um, Agreement as an example. <laughs> so in terms of the shifting funding paradigm, to me the best way to understand this is through the lens of failure. Because failure in philanthropy, at least from O's perspective, is an opportunity to learn. Um, and in the case of climate change, the failure to produce a framework convention in Copenhagen in 2009 uh, was a real blow to the sector, <clears throat> and I believe represented an important turning point in how climate philanthropy needed to redefine itself um, if it was really um, going to mobilize the global community around this issue. And I, I would say there were two major learnings. One is that uh, rational, scientific, arguments do not move people to act um, <clears throat> on climate change. And the second was that the environmental community uh, cannot carry this issue on its own. And so in the five intervening years between Copenhagen and Paris, I would say there were two main course corrections um, that have direct bearing on our discussion today. One is that there was a more concerted effort to work across sectors, whether they be financial, um, energy sectors, uh, working with city leaders, working with religious leaders. There was a much broader base of support, as, as, as the magazine indicates. The second major correction was that the well-being of people and communities must be at the center um, of any argument about address addressing the problem of climate change. <laughs> so climate philanthropy made a much more um, deliberate effort to embrace diverse constituencies, calling for action on climate change, and to challenge uh, and the challenges they faced in adapting to its consequences. So with people at the center, I would argue the discourse around climate change shifted from a moral-based argument, like you must do something about this, to one more centered on rights. And I'll spend the remainder um, of my time describing how Oak's new climate justice initiative um, reflects this trend and how it fits into the other investments made by um, Oak in climate change. So Oak Foundation has a long history of, of investing in climate change, um, probably dating back almost 15 years. 
It's one of the core issues of one of our trustees. Um, and much of the foundation's work in this area is focused on historic land mitigation um, by investing in emission reduction strategies uh, focused on transportation, cities, um, as, well, as well as avoiding major fossil fuel lock-ins um, like coal. Um, so post Paris, Oak's climate team sees to, um, to, that it's important to, to continue to support public pressure on governments to meet their voluntary commitments to reducing greenhouse gas emissions um, and to ramp up investments in alternative energy by at least tenfold um, by uh, current investments by um, foundations. So to complement um, this approach of largely focus on mitigation and emission reductions, the foundation recognized that because our mission is primarily rooted in social justice, um, it was important to meet the current and future needs of people most negatively affected by the impacts of climate change <clears throat> and um, build on the rights-based approaches that our other programs use in their um, uh, strategies. So <clears throat> beginning in 2014, uh, the foundation created a cross-program steering committee uh, representing our major program areas to develop a vision and a strategy for a more people-centered, rights-based approach to climate change. And Adrian Arena from our International Human Rights Program, who's here, is part of the steering committee, along with um, Florence Tessier, the director of the Offic uh, Issues Affecting Women's Program, Amanda Beswick from our Housing and Homelessness Program, Bridget DeLay from our Child Abuse Program, and our president, Kathleen Cabrera. Um, so, the vision and strategy centered on this concept of climate justice, and I think many of you probably understand there are many meanings attached to that term, um, uh, from talking about resilience or advocacy and movement building, to equity, to precaution, to human rights. So it, it encapsulates many things. So I think as a foundation, we had to be clear about what we meant by the term and, and how it would translate into grant-making practice. Um, so the conventional definition of climate justice um, refers to the recognition that there's an inherent injustice that those contributed um, least to the problem of climate change are suffering its greatest consequences. Um, in, terms, in terms of Oak's vantage point, um, I think we really wanted to zero, out on the, zero in on the fact that climate change has a disproportionate impact on certain key constituents, key constituencies important to different programs. And one of the main goals of the initiatives was to bring greater attention to their plight, the plight of these communities, with a special emphasis on youth, indigenous peoples, and women. And we chose those constituencies not simply because they are vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, um, but also because they have the greatest ability to catalyze um, new and innovative thinking in terms of coping with impacts and creating solutions to benefit communities. Um, and in this sense, it reflects a real shift um, from cha a charity-based giving model that focuses on <coughs> victims of climate change uh, to one that emphasizes agency um, and the belief that local communities are best positioned to develop their own solutions to the problems they face. The strategy also sees mitigation and adaptation as being intertwined, basically representing two uh, sides of the same coin. And from a mitigation standpoint, um, the strategy is designed to support and elevate the voices of youth, indigenous people, and women uh, on calling on governments to prioritize urgent um, and ambitious action on climate change. And from an adaptation perspective, we also seek to ensure those same communities are part of the decision-making process in terms of how adaptation plans are implemented um, and to at the regional and local level and ensure community voices are part of those decisions. Um, and from both of these standpoints, both mitigation and adaptation, we emphasize a human rights-based approach using the pillars of the human rights uh, panel principles as a way to guide such an approach. And so we put special em um, emphasis on 
the, the P, the A, and the E of the panel principles, the Scottish um, Human Rights Commission panel principles, um, dealing with participation, accountability, and empowerment. So now I just want to take the, the last few remaining minutes of our time to, to talk about how the grants we made in Paris sort of um, uh, reflect this approach and, and some of the lessons we learned in the grants. So um, in terms of participation, Oak made a series of grants to ensure that these voices of these indigenous people and women were present at um, the negotiations. And so we funded the Women's Environmental Development Organization, Tabteba, which is an indigenous people's uh, network, um, as well as Global Green Grants and 350.org to bring out the voices of, of youth. Um, and uh, in terms of, so they were all there, they were part of the, for all two weeks, God love them, it was, <laughs> it, was a, it was a lot to take in. Um, and um, they really tried to focus on ensuring human rights language, whether you're talking about indigenous peoples or women or the multi-generational uh, dimension of climate change, were included in the text of the agree agreement. I'll talk about um, how successful they were in a minute. And then on the accountability side, we really focused on the Green Climate Fund and, um, the, and holding the duty bearers of that fund accountable to the development and implementation of how those funds will be um, delivered and reflect the needs and priorities of communities on the ground. Um, and Joan will talk a little bit about um, work in that area in a minute. And then on the empowerment front, the E, much of the investments we made were multi-year, so we didn't expect things to just end in Paris. There's obviously a lot of follow-on work that's taking place to make sure that these voices continue to be part of the, dis the discussion. So lessons from these grants were, first, we felt like there's power in funding across sectors um, and movements. You know, by focusing specifically on indigenous people and women, we were bringing networks of organizations together that hadn't necessarily spoken, and we're certainly bringing funders together um, that didn't normally fund in the same arena. We had mixed results in terms of the outcome of Paris, I would say, according to you know the organizations we supported. Counter to what Terry, what you said, what Terry's point was that. Um, human rights wasn't at the center. I, I think there was a lot more discourse around human rights and social justice in Paris. A lot of people would say that the target of 1.5 as being more appropriate to um, emission reduction um, target was because small island developing nations were the ones calling for that using a climate justice, um, using climate justice uh, center, uh, center to their argument. In terms of reference to human rights in the actual agreement, I think many of the organizations felt like Paris was a disappointment because human rights wasn't referred to in, it was in the operative text until the last minute and then it went into the preamble as war as an, an aspiration. Um, that being said, um, Article 7, Section 5 of the agreement does acknowledge that states should follow country-driven, gender-responsive, participatory, and fully transparent approach, taking into consideration vulnerable groups, communities, and ecosystems. Um, and I think those are, that, that's language we can build on um, moving forward. So in terms of the next steps for Oak um, and climate justice, I, I think mostly we want to just make sure we keep rights at the center of um, of the discourse in climate philanthropy, um, and there are two areas that it, um, areas that are especially right for intervention. One is to ensure the intended nationally determined contributions of countries for reducing emissions, and the national level adaptation plans don't infringe upon people's rights. There's a real danger that they will, um, and that the second area for intervention is that. Um, I think we can help ensure that the new multilateral and bilateral funding platforms and schemes um, are made accessible and reach communities that need those funds most. A lot of times these funds are channeled to national governments and they don't actually reach communities 
Um, and so whether this will require a more direct grant making approach to constituency led uh, mechanisms, whether they be led by indigenous people or women or youth, represent an important opportunity, I think, for philanthropy. So these are just a few of the areas of work. I have a strategy uh, for the initiative with a lot more details in terms of where we're funding and the types of work we're funding. I'm happy to share that with you uh, via electronic, you know, through email. I don't have a bunch of copies with me, but, and I'm happy to entertain questions at all. Great, thank you. Just, okay. um, thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you for that overview of where you've got to. I'm sure there'll be opportunities to talk more about um, where those very interesting thoughts will lead in terms of the work that the board takes now. We're um, very happy to introduce Joan Carling, again, Secretary General of the Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact. For those that aren't familiar with the organisation, it's in, uh, Joan is a, an Indigenous activist, um, originally from the Philippines, but based in Thailand, has been working on Indigenous issues at grassroots and the international levels for more than 20 years. She has been elected twice as Secretary General of the People's Pact starting in 2008 and has been representing 47 member organisations across 14 countries. And it's uh, uh, great to have you with us to talk about climate justice, land tenure, Paris, and also your hopes for philanthropy and how it um, engages its grantees. And uh, good morning to everyone. I, I just want to briefly also add that uh, our work, because we are a constituent based organization uh, from the grassroots to the national level to the regional. So our approach is that we work at the grassroots level and amplify the voice from the grassroots to the national, regional, and global, and bring the global developments down to the local level. So it's a bottoms up and then a flow down. So uh, with this, we started in engaging on the issue of climate change uh, since 2009, by first developing awareness, raising materials for the communities to understand the phenomena of climate change because a lot are, are already happening on the ground and people cannot understand the changes in the weather and as, as, uh, as um, uh, Anne has mentioned, uh, we're the most vulnerable, we're on the front line because we're, the, uh, we're in fragile, isolated areas with no infrastructure almost, uh, but at the same time, we're the ones protecting uh, the environment and that has never been accounted for in, in any climate change this course at the global level. So we wanted to bring that in, especially on the issue of forest. So there's a lot from 2009, we've been following the, 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 the COP and attending all the intersectional meetings, mainly bringing the voice of indigenous peoples that our rights matters in finding solutions to climate change. Uh, one is, not, we're not only vulnerable, we are also contributing to solutions to climate change. We, were, we are the ones protecting the environment and have done so for centuries. But this is being uh, exploited, extracted, and even uh, uh, set, set, uh, segregated for conservation, which is also isolating us from the environment that is the basis of our culture, integrity, and dignity as peoples. So it's a two, two pronged uh, uh, dimension that we were fighting. One is to, to uh, conserve uh, and, 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 and continue our sustainable uh, resource management uh, practices and also to, to prevent land grabbing because that, that's the only way we can effectively also address climate change. So with that, uh, our engagement has in, in, in the COP is, is really for indigenous people's rights, human rights, to be at the center of, uh, of, of the, the framework. So a human rights-based approach, that's one. Second is for the effective participation of indigenous people's local communities and social movements in the climate change. Because unless we are there also defining the solutions, our issues, our perspectives will not be considered. And so our effective participation and representation is, is critical. So in, in first cup, what is our view? Uh, well, uh, we were the ones, there were more than 500 indigenous in, in Paris because it's, it's a life and death issue for us, whatever the outcome is. 
Now, uh, as I stated, while we were the ones pushing for the human rights language, through we, 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 we have what we call uh, the friends of indigenous peoples among states, and, and those who really championed uh, the inclusion of human rights, which unfortunately did not make it in the operational part, was Philippines, Canada, Mexico, Mary Robinson was there, and unfortunately, EU was even blocking the language of human rights uh, in, in, in the operative part. And it was a tough negotiation, and, and we, but we were able to, to, uh, to do our own demonstration inside but, and outside, and at the same time, engaging actively with, with states. Uh, so, uh, so I think keeping the human rights language, even in the preamble, is already a success. Because what matters is how the, 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 how the, the COP outcome is going to be implemented. It's not what's written on the paper, per se, but how will that be implemented? And the, the challenge now is that what will the civil society, the social movements, indigenous peoples are going to do on, uh, to push that, to make that a clear commitment that it will be translated into action. And that's where we need that from the global, we need to already bring that at the local and national level and for social movements, indigenous organizations to take that and push it at the national level. Because it's the states, it's the corporations working in these countries that has to be made to account. And, and, and that's where uh, uh, I, I think we need to, to step up efforts on how do we then try to build uh, the constituencies, because they will be the one to make a big difference on how the COP will be implemented. It's to keep governments to account, to make corporations to, to account, to make sure that the, the principles of social justice, equity, is going to happen. And there are risks that we need to acknowledge, and that's why it's, it's that, 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 that makes it even more important to act on the ground. And from our perspective, for example, there are risks in relation to some of the solutions provided. On, on, on renewable energy, for example, large dumps is considered a clean energy still. And you can just imagine that, that the impact. And from the region I come from, there are more than 100 large dumps in the pipeline. We, if you recall, uh, uh, Berta Caceres was killed because of her defense of, of land by opposing dams. Then you also have the oil pine, the biofuel plantation. These are going to cause land grabs if it's not going to be rights-based, ecosystems-based, and more importantly, if it will not put indigenous peoples at the center of managing our own resources. Uh, so, so that's an area, and when we look at the forest, the issue of the carbon sequestration, we know forest conservation is going to be critical. And uh, indigenous peoples are the ones in the forests. Uh, and 85% uh, cons in conservation of conservation areas are the territories of indigenous peoples. And if they will conserve the forest by evicting us, then that is going to be disastrous. Because even in the, in the scientific evidence based study on forests, the most protected forests are the forests managed by indigenous peoples and local communities. Those managed by states are the, are the, problematic, are the problematic ones. They are the ones getting deforest, deforested. So crit, the, the, cent, the critical issue here is how do we ensure land tenure? so that communities, indigenous peoples, will be able to manage their forests and contribute the most to climate change mitigation. So that's one area. So now, if I, if, and, and before I go to my proposal, just a comment on the GCF, the Green Climate Fund. This is the biggest fund ever created, right? Where rich countries or developed countries has made commitments to contribute, and this will flow to developing countries. But the problem is there is yet no clear accountability mechanism put in place, no social and environmental safeguards put in place. So 
if funds are going to flow to these countries and governments are not made to account, you can just imagine how, how these funds will eventually end up in the pockets of politicians or corporations that they are partnering with. And they're all doing this in the name of you know, renewable energy, uh, mitigation measures. But just to cite an example, I come from the Philippines where we had the, the worst typhoon, the Haiyan, when because of some international solidarity, there was a generous flow of funds and resources. But where did this end up? It ended up in the pocket of politicians. Rice that were given ended up just in the store. They were not even storeroom. They were not even distributed. The government made a loan to the World Bank in billions. Nobody knows where that is. And the victims of Haiyan are still struggling to have shelter and food and livelihood. So th th that's why it's important for us to, to really monitor also the, the uh, global, uh, the GCF, the funds, and make governments to account, and especially since they're partnering with corporations, that they have to uh, be transparent, and we need to make sure that it will really go to the most marginalized, to those vulnerable, and to, to those uh, in need. So finally, uh, in terms of the uh, one can uh, the donors or or can, I think the first step is that we need to build a partnership beyond the issue of uh, of uh, grantee or beneficiary, not not to go beyond that kind of relation and build a relation that is uh, that is uh, based on, on a, a common. Uh, common objective of pursuing social justice, pursuing climate justice in, in a long-term kind of partnership where we can actually contribute in a long-term process of empowering indigenous peoples and local communities to, be, to, for, to enable them to contribute the most on climate change. Because it's it's to build, it's to start from strength, to build from the strength that we already have, the kind of resilience that we already have, the, the, the sustainable resource management that we bring on the table, and supporting us in, in terms of land tenure, uh, securing our our, our 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 resources, and beyond that, also ensuring that we have sustainable livelihood. Because there are also pressures. I, I can tell you. Uh, in, in countries where even land, land rights is already given and communities have their titles, but they are consistently under pressure by mining, biofuels, because they're not able to, uh, to have their sustainable livelihoods. So support along that line and also on renewable energy that is community-based, and I want to emphasize that, that is community-managed, will make that difference. And I think that's where uh, uh, donors, uh, philanthropists can leverage other big grants in terms of, of uh, not only uh, monitoring but also policy, but ensuring that, that the initiatives of, 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 of communities are replicated and complemented in a more long-term level of empowerment. Because it's, it's central to empower communities. We cannot just build renewables here and there, it, it will not lead to the economic and political empowerment of building their institutions so that they determine their own <laughs> development and, and, and then they can also share and have an interlearning on how we build a sustainable future. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Jen, for those very powerful words. I think anyone's wondering what climate justice looks like. <laughs> Very helpful as we were putting together the edition um, on climate philanthropy with tips, sources of advice and perspectives throughout the process. I would pick up the phone, she'd always be, be there. And I just wanted to thank you for that as well. Um, Florence directs and coordinates a network of, I think, over 100 funders um, uh, in the UK addressing environmental issues, including um, climate change. Um, and I'm just going to hand over to Florence to speak there. Thank you, Charles. 
Um, I'm going to step back a little bit uh, and talk about what we know as, about climate philanthropy as a whole. Um, specifically, I'll talk about what the grant-making data tell us about uh, the big picture of climate philanthropy in the UK and Europe. Then I'll talk about trends in climate philanthropy, what funders think has worked really well so far in addressing climate change, where their funds seem to be aggregating. And then I'll move on to climate justice more specifically, and the idea that environmental funders in the UK at least seem to really shy away from discussing climate justice, but in practical terms, as I discovered when I was sort of preparing for this, they do actually seem to be funding at that intersection of climate and social justice. And then finally, I'll look at the question that Charles asked me to answer of whether or not we need more funds directed towards climate change and climate justice. So Charles mentioned the FN is a network of trusts and foundations, and they give to a very broad um, array of environmental and related causes. And the goal of the network is to improve the effectiveness of environmental philanthropy and to try and increase the total amounts of money going to environmental causes overall. And in fact, we've just hired someone with the sole purpose of doing that. So hopefully we'll be able to see, sort of see more traction than we've seen so far. And one of the things that we do is conduct research into where grants are going and where they're not uh, in terms of issues and geographies. And what we've found is that grants addressing climate change from UK environmental funders overall have increased quite dramatically in their share of total UK environmental philanthropy. So in 2002 to 3, it was only about 2 or 3% of total environmental philanthropy. It's gone up to about a quarter. But that's just between 1 and 2% of total philanthropy in the UK. And it's still just this drop in the bucket. And the absolute figures are really telling. Between 2010 and 2012, which is quite a long time ago now, but it's the latest uh, years for which I have comprehensive data, the total amounts of funds directed towards climate change from all UK trusts, foundations and lottery funds amounted to £45 million over a two-year period. That is enough to buy one of Gareth Bale's legs when he was transferred to Tottenham, to, from Tottenham Hotspur to Real Madrid. <laughs> we would have got half of Gareth Bale, and that's a two-year period of climate funding. Meanwhile, in Europe, where we do have much uh, later figures, because the European Foundation Centre is about to publish a new report, we've discovered that climate funding has gone down between 2011 and 2014. It was about 109 million euros, it's gone down to about 90 million euros. That was really shocking to me because we had assumed that funding was ramping up uh, before Paris and we were concerned that funding would, that funding would take a nosedive after Paris because funders would sort of think, oh well Paris was quite successful and really time to focus our attention so far. So if it is going to, to decline after Paris, that's alarming I think. Especially as, as we've discussed, Paris is really only successful if it's acted upon and improved upon. So uh, given that climate change funding is really quite small in absolute terms, I think it's really quite remarkable what the climate movement has accomplished so far. And we're on track now for three to four degrees of change, which is terrifying and not nearly enough. But it's significantly different from where we were. We were on a trajectory up to six degrees not that long ago. And when I've spoken to funders, they really feel that a lot of what they've supported has, has contributed to that difference between six degrees and three degrees. So I thought I, I polled some of the funders that I worked with find out what they think has been most effective uh, and to give us a sense of what the trends are in environmental, in climate philanthropy specifically. And they mentioned some of the following things. So, in the UK and across Europe, stopping new coal has really gained traction and there are great uh, collaborations between funders and NGOs working on those issues. In the UK specifically, securing the coal phase out was a massive win. And of course the Climate Change Act was also a huge step forward and those things have real global significance, or did, before we uh, withdrew from the European Union, which will have uh, no end of unintended consequences, I think, when it comes to climate change. Several funders listed divestment as being a really huge shift in where their grant making is focused in, what, what, in terms of what has been uh, effective, along with Mark Campanelli's over here, his carbon bubble narrative that Carbon Tracker has produced. That's been, that was named by several funders as being really uh, um, powerful in changing the finance sector's perception of risk uh, and corroding the social license of fossil fuel companies. And in general, I would say that one of the most obvious trends in climate philanthropy is this shift in focus towards the finance sector and financial drivers of, uh, of climate change. 
I convened a group of specialist climate funders last autumn to sort of pitch ideas at each other. What are the best ideas that have come across your desk in the last six months to a year to, for mitigating climate change? And that conversation was really dominated by initiatives uh, focused on um, tackling the financial drivers of fossil fuel extraction, so investment, uh, fossil fuel subsidies, export credit agencies. And then finally, funders listed the really strong role that NGOs played in the run-up to Paris in terms of um, shaping the narrative that came out there, and we've heard that really uh, eloquently from both of you. Um, but also from organisations like Carbon Brief and the Energy and Climate Intelligence Unit, sort of helping to shift the conversation. And then I'll come back to the divestment briefly, because those were all trends in grant making. But divest invest has been a massive trend sort of out beyond grant making in sort of forcing foundations to examine their, their investment portfolios and see how they align or do not align with their with their climate goals. And committing to divest invest requires foundations not just to divest from fossil fuels, but to commit to investing 5% of their endowments in climate solutions. And that's renewable energy, energy efficiency, clean tech, but it's also specifically relevant to climate justice, energy access for those people who do not have it. And I'm told there's a Mercer report coming out very soon that will indicate that new funds are coming onto the market now to allow investors to invest in energy access. And that's in no small part because of this increased demand from signatories to divest invest, saying we need somewhere to put our money that is supporting energy access. So that's a, um, a useful segue into the subject of climate justice. <coughs> and I think from, you both have touched on this actually now, but from a philanthropy point of view, I think it's really important to acknowledge there are these different angles to climate justice, not just the fact that the impacts of climate change will be felt most by those who have contributed to it the least, but the fact that every intervention to help mitigate climate change or adapt to it will affect people in different ways. There will be winners and losers, or there can be. And so funders have to be very careful about what interventions they're funding in terms of how they will either exacerbate or alleviate pre-existing inequalities in society. But as I mentioned, I have found that environmental funders in the UK at least tend not to speak about this. It sort of go, this climate justice um, angle goes unspoken. And so when I looked at the data for 2014, I have data for the biggest, 30 biggest uh, environmental grant makers in the UK for 2014. And I went through, and it was entirely subjective, admittedly, but I went through and marked which grants I thought uh, were addressing the intersection of climate change, social justice, human rights. And actually 40% of them were, which really surprised me. Uh, they were supporting the, an enormous diversity of initiatives. Um, Amazon watches work with indigenous people to um, defend their land against fossil fuel extraction. Uh, work to bring solar lighting to communities that are off-grid, uh, like that of solar aid. Work in the UK to make sure that the energy transition is inclusive and benefits everyone, like the work that 1010 is doing. Uh, the work the Energy Bill Revolution Coalition did at the intersection of fuel poverty and climate change. Those kinds of projects were really were, amounted to 40% of the total giving in 2014. <coughs> so why aren't people talking about it so much? I don't, I don't have a solid answer to that. My sense is partly that human rights and social justice are perhaps too politically radical for some funders, even if they are actually funding in that way, the sort of language around it feels too radical. But I think it's also just linguistic. I think it's much easier to talk about climate change and social justice and human rights, and we find it hard to know how to speak at the intersection of those three issues. And Eva Bracer convened funders at our retreat last year who said human rights funding, at sort of approaching environmental issues from a human rights perspective, is challenging for them because they feel intimidated about the language around human rights. They don't really feel like they understand the human rights framework. So I think there's a sort of language barrier there. And I also think the environmental justice sector is very well developed in other places, like in the United States, it's a really strong environmental justice movement. And it's not really very strong in the UK, so that language has yet to infuse the UK um, <coughs> environmental philanthropy <coughs> sector. So that gets me to my, my last question of whether enough funding is directed at climate issues in general and climate uh, justice specifically. And the answer is, to me, blatant, it's no. <laughs> If you look at the total amounts of money going to environmental causes from UK plus and foundations, it's somewhere in the region of 110 million pounds per year. So you could get Gareth Bale and an extra foot for that <laughs> annual, and that's all environmental issues, all of them. So we definitely need new funds flowing to address climate change, but I, they cannot be scattershot 
there's such an urgency, the timelines are so tight. Scientists are saying, if current emission, at current emission rates, we'll have to stop emitting in eight years if we want a 50% chance of staying within one and a half degrees. In eight years' time, we'll have to stop emitting at the rates we're emitting at. So the key to any new funding is that it's really got to be applied to the real drivers of climate change. It's got to be focused on interventions that are scalable, highly infectious, it's got to support work that will act quickly, and in my opinion, it's got to fund at the multi-year level. So one-year grants are not going to cut it when you're talking about having to scale things up quickly, because organisations need to hire staff and prepare for the future. Uh, and I spoke to Keith Allett at the European Climate Foundation about what the key interventions he felt were, and he listed developing renewable power at a massive scale, large-scale reforestation, and keeping the 12 largest carbon bombs in the ground. And all of these things could be done with a view to climate justice, but, you know, it's a sort of a just transition. But I, I worry that with the speed and the pressure to do things quickly, that lens will not necessarily be, will not necessarily be used. So uh, I'll just end quickly with something I think really brings the importance and relevance of climate justice into sharp focus, and that is Global Witnesses Report that came out last week. I don't know how many of you saw it their annual report on the murder of environmental and land activists. And 2015 was the deadliest year on record for people defending their land, their forests, their rivers uh, from destructive industries. Three people were killed every week. So that's what this is about. There are front lines in the battle against climate change, and people are literally dying on those front lines. And the most high-profile person to die was Berta Caceres, but it's so chastening to realise she was one of maybe 200 people killed in the same way. So I think this problem is only going to get worse as we try and address climate change because the pressure on land is increasing. The pressure on fossil fuel extraction is increasing. Uh, we're going to see more and more large-scale hydrodams as sort of solutions to climate change. So I think what funders can and should be doing about this is really, really important. So I'll just direct you to Ava again, who uh, published a really thoughtful blog. Would you wave your hand to me? Uh, she published a really thoughtful blog on EFN's blog a couple of months ago about what funders can do, some practical guidance on things funders can do to step up to that challenge. Thank you very much, Florence. Uh, and some interesting observations about how the rush to actually address climate change would not inevitably be uh, solutions that would uh, incorporate uh, climate justice and the needs of uh, people that could be affected and that, that tension seems to me very striking. Um, let's just say with Eva um, from the Global Green Grants Fund in the UK, that um, that's the twin organisation of um, Global Green Grants who are so involved in um, central to this, this edition, so there's lots more um, yeah, in the magazine as well, but do talk to her. Um, I think while I have lots of questions, um, uh, I'm sure we have lots of questions about one another's presentations, I think we should use the time to actually open up uh, now for questions and comments from all of you. And, but my colleagues are Sam and uh, Holly here, and they'll help uh, pass the microphone uh, from, well, from, from uh, uh, between you. Um, perhaps, if, depending on who has questions, you raise your hands um, with any comments or questions. Um, and then we can maybe take two or three at a time and then we can, we can see who wants to respond. So take you from a big Christian and let's get to the Um, hello, I'm Christian Allen from Christian Aid, and we've been working on environmental justice for many years. So um, I was really heartened by your, your reflections, and there's lots I, I want to ask about, and particularly share discussions around Paris. But I want to add in something to the debate that you've not mentioned so far, which is particularly around that challenge of the intersectionality of climate with broader social justice and inequality issues, which is to sort of to ask you. To what extent do you think that the Sustainable Development Goals that were agreed at the UN in September that did actually help frame the COP quite, quite a bit could be an opportunity to, to build more on that language of, of inclusion and tackling inequality? And um, one of the good things about the goals is that it, it is very integrated, even though they are complex and larger and more challenging. They are still frameworks that governments have agreed to. <coughs> okay, just a gentleman here, and then a gentleman two behind. 
Uh, yeah, Trevor Rins from uh, Living Earth Foundation. Um, there's a, a question or maybe an observation which is about the extent to which um, donors look too much for uh, solutions that are known. And what I mean by that is uh, these are new problems being faced by organisations and uh, coalitions of people who have to mobilise for the first time and there aren't any known easy answers and yet are we somehow held back from looking for things that we can prove a business case for, we can develop the love frame for? Is, is that holding back some donors? You made the point about learning from failure. I might extend that to the ability to learn from experimenting in new types of solutions. Thank you. Yes, Jakob Willard stood from the, um, the World Future Council. I want to comment on Something you have said, but I think we have to really be aware that you know there are real, many real conflicts, and how do we, how do we deal with that? I mean, we, uh, World Future Council works with policymakers on the how. So there are many organisations working on the what needs to be done and why we want to go. But we are working on the how, and you see that the quickest way to change is quite often to change policies. I mean, we've got feed-in tariffs introduced in, in this country by like translating the materials and working it with the peace, etc. And then pretty soon you realise you know, there are conflicts between sovereignty and you know, good governance and the rights of current generations and the rights of future generations and the rights of the environment. And uh, I used to find it very, very difficult to come to conclusions until I read a statement by the Austrian philosopher Victor Frankl said, you know, you, when you have a hierarchy of risks and dangers, you have to realize that sometimes the right thing to do may only be 55% right. And so, you know, we have two awards, one for best practices, one for best policies. And so we discussed, we gave the first best practice award, do we give it in China, the first award in China? Do we give it to a human rights dissident, or do we give it to one of the largest uh, solar entrepreneurs? And we chose the largest solar entrepreneur because we said the most important thing for the future of the world, for the right to life, is China's transition and support to renewable energy. And the same thing, but then looked at the best forestry laws, and we found the, the best forestry law um, in the world is the one in Rwanda. And you know, we had a discussion, we actually give an award to a Rwandan policy, which obviously we can see also as an award to the current Rwandan government. And again, we decided to do so because we said, you know, preserving the environment, preserving the forests is in the hierarchy of risks and dangers is even more important than the fact that Rwanda certainly wouldn't win, the current government wouldn't win the human rights award at the moment. So I think this is, to me is the key issue where also we need to front forward create alliances and you know, decide on a sort of a sharing task, but we need a discussion about hierarchies of risks and how do you deal with these conflicts. Thank you. I think um, before we have another round, um, <coughs> we should uh, go for some responses. I think I'm struck by your, your last question in terms of the trade-offs and what that might entail for certain programs. Uh, um, maybe Joan might have some comments on that. But, um, if Joe was going to talk about this, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, 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 uh, I did not actually mention that, but uh, definitely there's a there's a, a lot of, of of links between the climate change and the sustainable development, uh, and even more so from the perspective of indigenous, because we, because we don't see things in isolation. This is all about the integrity of the ecosystems. This is all about supporting our, our life ways, our culture, and, and you don't separate the, uh, the elements. But, but you're right about also the SDG, because it's only in the SDG that the issue of uh, equity has been discussed within countries and uh, among countries. Uh, and that is very, very significant uh, that finally, the issue of in, existing inequality and inequity within countries and among countries is now going to be addressed at the global level. Uh, the, there is also the, the, the goals that is uh, addressing particularly the issue of forest and forest conservation, that's goal 15, also biodiversity and, and of course the, the goal on climate change. So these are all now of, uh, within the dimension of the sustainable development goals. The remaining challenge though is, is it still framed more or less on the business as usual approach that we need to keep on challenging 
and also ensuring that the, the common but differentiated responsibility, which is also within the framework of the climate change, applies also to the sustainable development goals. And more importantly, how can we make a, a social movement that will again uh, make governments uh, and, 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 and corporates to account and for them to, to, uh, to do their commitments and obligations for sustainable development. And, and finally, it's the, 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 the new thing with the sustainable development goals now is that it applies to all countries. It's not just uh, developing countries. Uh, so the issue of, of poverty, the issue of inequality will also have to be addressed at a global scale. Uh, just to comment on the risks uh, and, and, <coughs> and the hierarchy of rights and risks, I, I, I think what, what, what and, and addressing conflict, I, I think that that's even, the, we need to have a clear framework in the first place of understanding conflicts. Because if we don't have the clear framework of justice and human rights in understanding conflict, then we will not be able to fairly address the, the causes of those conflicts. And, and, but, but I do agree with you that we need to also encourage good practice and award those who are doing good practice. Uh, but at the same time, we need to point out those that are do, do not doing well it's, it's called the, it's, it's, it's like awarding and shaming, both. It's not an either or, uh, an either or thing, right? And, and we need to also see, see so while we're the, and, and that is now the growing discussion on under business and human rights, for example. That a business that are doing well in terms of human rights, committing to human rights, they need to be uh, held higher than those that are not doing well, so that we, we create champions, and, and I think that's, that's, that's a good approach, so that we also try to, to persuade those not doing well to do well. Peer pressure. Yeah, peer pressure, so to speak. So, I, um, yeah, that's just my comment on that. Quickly, on the experimentation question, um, you know, I think with experiment comes risk, you know, whether donors are prepared to take risks, and, um, Fortunately, at OP, are encouraged to take risks. Um, and I, I just came back from a um, global staff retreat where we had a session on the new economy. And this um, is an interesting area that um, I'm still learning about. But, but I think it is an example of taking risk um, and experimenting with new models of exchange and community-managed assets and um, really... Uh, moving away from business as usual in terms of financial flows and things like that. And, you know, for example, it, it, I think it ties into this just transition kind of frame where um, in the United States and in, in the Southwest, Peabody Coal had it was a big um, company working in the Southwest and pulled out. Most of the Navajo Nation worked for that company were then they didn't want the company, but they were dependent on the income. And now they're in positions like, how can we invest in our own um, energy development that will um, you know, not contribute to climate change and also benefit our communities directly? Those are risky financial endeavors. But I think there's a growing, there's a growing movement in the financial sector that's sort of looking at these alternative models for um, for energy and, and supporting community managed, um, you know, energy uh, redistribution, or even in the case of, of Joan, like community managed forests and things like that, that can support livelihoods locally. So that's just one example. Thank you. For uh, yeah. yeah, well just quickly, in terms of that um, experimenting and risk idea, I think it's really important for funders to remember that they're basically the only institutions with money who are accountable to no one. So they're really the only ones who are able to take risks. Um, and a lot of funders do, but not all of them do. A lot of them are very risk averse. Uh, and their funding ends up just aligning with government statutory pots of funding, which are already you know, available there. Um, in terms of the uh, question about risk, sorry, um, the hierarchies of risk, I think I have a sort of philosophical answer to it, which isn't helpful at a practical level, but I really feel like climate change is, and all our environmental issues are a product of our exploitation 
which is of people and of the environment. I think it's one and the same thing. So if you're addressing the, the symptoms of the problem without addressing both rooms, which is the exploitation of people and the exploitation of the environment, you're in the long term not, you're going to just keep seeing these problems as long as we keep exploiting each other. Well, just picking up on that before we go to the, to the next question, I just want to ask the gentleman about the trade-off that you made um, with China and the WAG rewards that, 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 that you offered. Were you also at the same time able to remind them of responsibilities around human rights and social justice at the same time as rewarding progress that either Rwanda or China had made, or did you find that you couldn't do both at the same time? Well, it's, it's very difficult, of course, you know, when you work with with governments, and in, in Rwanda, no, I mean, we know the problems there, but we felt that the reforestation policy was so extensive that we decided to award it. And of course, when you give an award to a policy, uh, and it has been passed even by a previous government, you sometimes find the current government sort of tries to get the credit. At the same time, you have anchored the policy, and the current government tries to weaken the game. If they say, okay, that the supporters say, well, it's got this national award, so you know, you basically had to make a choice. And we, I mean, our choice there, that was a one-off, our choice in China, is very much working with the government because we are seeing that the, the transition in China, which is happening very, very rapidly, is of course partly because it is an authoritarian government and they can do this transition very quickly. But we see for the world, this Chinese transition is more important and, you know, than the, the expense of supporting Chinese systems, which lots of other organizations are doing. We also have to decide not everybody can, can do everything. But we have tried very hard to build the credibility in China, which meant that this new law now, which is hampering NGOs, and I spoke to our contact in the Chinese government, and said, but that doesn't apply to you, because we see you as an international organization. You come here, you work with the UN, you work with the Parliamentary Union. So it's a choice we have made. Thank you. Other questions? Comments? So um, um, we've got a uh, lady right at the back, and then we'll go to you, and then over to you, Eva, and then uh, we'll take another round. Thanks. Hi, I'm Fiona from the Climate Coalition. Um, we've been working to the, um, actually kind of the other end of, of climate activism, which is to, um, it's basically about kind of public engagement and increasing the visibility of, of the the silent majority of people that care about climate change in the UK and making sure that's visible to politicians. Um, so that's, that's a much longer um, goal. Um, it's, well, it's a, lot, a long game, but it's also we don't have the same rewards in terms of that this carbon cut is a result of uh, you know, our work. But, but obviously we feel it's really important because without that we're not going to get action from our government. So I was just wondering if there was any sense of what funders feel about that? You know, do, 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 they, do they feel the same that that's actually crucial? Or because it felt a little bit from the panel discussion that, that the emphasis should be on kind of uh, programmes which are going to kind of implement the carbon cuts. Um, and so it'd be just interesting to get some perspective on that. <coughs> Thank you, Fiona. Gentlemen here, and then over to them, and back to the panelists. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Charles Appleby, and I'm from Saving Our Planet. Um, we believe that urgent action is required to tackle emissions, uh, the emissions gap that's identified clearly in the uh, Alliance magazine this month. And uh, we believe there's also a lot more scope for what the voluntary sector can do. So a carbon tax would seem a logical way to incentivise everyone to produce less uh, CO2. But in terms of a lot of the ways this has been put forward, it's just going to be too complicated and take too long. Um, although obviously it's worth, it's worth pursuing in parallel. But there is something that would, could be done on these lines, which is actually much, uh, much quicker, and basically could be starting next month. And that is very simply just to message out to everyone, to invite people to stop what CO2 they can and pay a fee for the rest of the CO2 that they can't. Um, this would be a voluntary donation, uh, with all funds going to our projects specifically uh, aimed at removing CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, so basically there's a, a huge amount of benefits um, to this, because it, it aligns something very simple and practical directly as a marketing message in, in line with what uh, people might be willing to, to go along with. And I'd be really interested in feedback from the panel and from 
anybody else in, uh, about what they think about that. And obviously this is something that would be about everybody joining in. It's not about one, uh, one organisation. It's an idea um, that can be promoted by everybody. Thank you. Just like I have no agreements, but I was really struck by the figures that Ron shared with us. And I'm wondering how we can grow this part um, that, you know, that, that is obviously out there. Um, and is there a job there to message more to those donors? At least 40% that you found, even at the cursory scan, uh, message more about um, why they're funding there and kind of bring that up more and tell these stories more so that more people are inspired to, to look at their own funding practice. And also in the same way, um, how is all sharing that that experiment of, of bringing your different uh, departments together and programs together, and how are you sharing that with us? Because I think that's again an amazing thing. So thank you. Let's start with that question. That's a great actual opportunity to have it and to talk just a little bit more specifically about the climate justice initiative um, in relation to the question. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think in terms of increasing the pot, I. I think there are two things we can do. One is to leverage some of these this new multilateral bilateral funding. Like I think there's there's something there that we can do to make sure those funds actually um, benefit some of the communities we're trying to serve. And then secondly, I would just just I think funders I don't know this might be Oaks culture, but I think um, donors like to collaborate. Um, at least in the United States, and I think so increasingly in Europe. And so Oak runs on this model, basically. It's, it's, we're a collaborative foundation. We work in partnership with other donors on almost every issue we're working on. Some of the issues we're working on are, there, it is hard to find other donors. Um, there's a, often under-resourced. But in the environment program in particular, you know, we're a member of the European Climate Foundation. Uh, we're a member of the Climate Works Foundation. We're also a member of this Oceans 5 funding network that was referenced in the magazine. Um, I work in the Arctic, and I'm part of the Arctic Funders Collaborative. And so I feel, I, I think don't we can increase the pie if we sort of increase this notion of collaboration, because no one foundation can tackle, certainly, climate change on their own, and I think Funders feel better when they're working together and they can share intelligence on the issues and share sort of research they've commissioned and you can just leverage your resources better and you're not alone trying to tackle you know, a huge problem. So, so I think the extent to which you know, European Funders Network, you know, they, these funder affinity groups are an interesting um, area because they're trying to grow the field, but some are more strategic than others in terms of really developing collaborative strategic partnerships where funders agree on a common goal or something issue where they can do complementary grant making or pool funding. I mean those are those are hard. It's hard to do. But if you if you get the right chemistry and the group of foundations working together, I think you can really grow the pie. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And the, that's interesting because the focus that we've taken with this new power that we have is to start focusing on individual donors high net worth and ultra high net worth individuals with the idea that we've found it hard to shift what foundations are doing mm -hmm. and it will be easier to tap into people who don't already have a set of charitable objectives to stick with. But I think we will end up doing both. Both, yeah. Um, so I don't have, we don't have, I mean, I, we need good ideas. I'm open to people's great ideas. I hire somebody who has great ideas her, herself, but we want to hear ideas from the field about how we can help. Well, what's your thoughts on the idea from this gentleman? Put me on the spot there. Um, I mean, I think it's a hard sell to be honest. It, it's down to people doing this as uh, out of their goodwill, is what you're suggesting. It would be a donation. Yeah, I mean, asking people to put their money where their mouth is is a, is a good idea, but we'll see if it, it can actually work. I don't know. I, I would like to talk to you more about it afterwards, actually. Great. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to go to Fiona's comment, because I think that the what you're doing is part and parcel of implementing Paris, because you are the ones mobilising the public to put the pressure on the government to actually ratify what they said they would do. And so I think it's, it's one and the same. I think funders are really interested in it. 
and really interested in the idea that you're reaching uh, the, the untraditional groups, the Women's Institute and all sorts of groups who aren't typically Christian aid, typically involved. So yeah, I think there's a lot of interest amongst others. Um, yeah, um, on the carbon tax or I want to show the, the other side of it. Uh, while, of course, uh, we know that it's uh, in, in the developed countries that emissions are, are much higher, where reduction also by the, the citizens will will contribute. On the other hand, for, for indigenous peoples with the least carbon footprint and us protecting our forests, the way REV is proceeding now is what they call the results-based payment, that you get paid from the carbon that you have uh, stored, right? But the, the but the it's a uh, the, the payment is not clear where it goes. If it goes, it, and largely it, it will be through the states because it's like it's 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 a state. So uh, it, there's no guarantee that it will reach the communities who are actually doing the conservation. And more importantly, we're putting in the argument that 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 forest is not just carbon. It has some multi-value and multi-purpose and, and multiple benefits. And communities who are protecting the forest should also be compensated, not necessarily in terms of monetary terms, but in terms of supporting their livelihoods, providing basic social services that, that they don't have. But this is not figuring out in what they call the results-based payment. And that's where, again, the, on the other hand, lockers or companies who have committed, okay, even if they have a lease on this forest, they will not, they will be paid if they will not cut the trees. They will be paid for doing that, but the communities, indigenous communities who have been protecting the forest for centuries will never be paid. So it's this huge uh, scheme. And, and I, I think we need to raise our, 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 our voice on this because it's, it's, it's a complete distortion of, of, I mean, it goes against the principle of equity, social justice, and really finding solutions to, uh, to climate change. I, I also want to contribute more on how collaboration of funders can also leverage uh, what the bilateral uh, uh, governments, uh, the bilateral funding is, is, is providing. I just want to go back, for example, on the issue of the GCF. Uh, because now, even if a number of civil society are engaging at the global level, the projects that are submitted for funding are coming from national governments in, in, in support of their INDCs. But the problem is they're not already, they're not involving indigenous peoples or social movements or civil society. So that the one they're submitting is not ensuring that it is done in an inclusive manner so meaning there is a cap in terms of the engagement. We need to support engagement also at the national level because these are where policies, programs, projects are done. And if we're not there, then it's more difficult to influence the, the global one. So we need to, to uh, also support the global in, uh, engagement, but also at the national, more importantly also the, the national one. Now, finally, just to comment on the policy, I, I think we also need to look at policy and practice at the same time. Uh, China, for example, they may not have a good policy on social and environmental protection, but in practice, they are actually the ones pulling out of dumb projects when they know it's high risk. From socially, when there are strong protests, they translate that into economic loss. So they've been, if you look at the evidences, they're actually the ones pulling out it. Even the case of the dam, where Bertha was killed, it originally it was Chinese, but they pulled out. And so the European corporations stepped in. Mm -hmm. So they, they also have, so it, it's also good to show the practice side. And on the policy side, we also have good laws that actually recognize land tenure. But the, pro, the implementation is so bad. So uh, in, in the case of, 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 of India, which has millions, they have the Forest Rights Act, which provides a, a legal recognition of community land rights. But it's not properly implemented. In fact, it is being uh, implemented for individual land titles, which is causing more conflict, which is making more communities lose their land. 
because then they eventually sell out because of pressures. But if it's community owned, it's, it's more difficult to dispose. So it actually became an instrument of land grabbing than protection. So, uh, so that, that's, that's, I, I think that's, that's what we need to see if, if policies are actually delivering the expected outcomes or, or, or not. Got um, Robert Dufton and the gentleman just to his left. Uh, we've just got time for probably those last two questions that will bring one thing for the rest. Thank you very much. Uh, Robert Dufton, um, I'm from the Grantham Centre for Sustainable Futures at the University of Sheffield. And uh, on an interdisciplinary basis, our themes are enough for everyone, which speaks to rights and climate justice and reducing consumption. Um, but although we're training a new generation of scholars, including a fantastic scholar from the Philippines, I really want to speak from, from another perspective, which is um, I'm a member of the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and all the UK research councils jointly are um, now entrusted with the responsibility of the Global Challenges Research Fund, which is a big new initiative. It's the only bit of free money uh, for research in the UK community. And it's going to grow to 1.5 billion pounds will be spent over five years. I do think there's a great opportunity for other funders to think quite carefully about the skills and experience that they already have as a way of influencing how the Global Challenges Research Fund is used. Because universities are going to be bidding for these funds, <coughs> trying to frame the nature of the calls, and particularly the arts and humanities. Uh, account for 40% of uh, scholars in the UK, and it is the arts and humanities scholars which will be the ones who are going to be advocating for a rights-based approach around themes of migration, conflict resolution. And from my own perspective, as a former foundation director, um, perhaps picking up Florence's point, I think there is a risk-based approach by engaging directly Government. I agree a passive approach and mining simply to government programs is it's not very uh, risk-based. But I think if you positively engage and try and shape a government's program, in some sense hold it accountable, and particularly advance the cause of human rights, that would be really significant and a very, very important issue for the whole of the UK universities who are going to be working in the overseas development countries in partnerships where we also have a role in brokering partnerships. So I think it's a great role for independent funders that can afford with this Global Challenges Research Fund. Thank you very much for pointing that out. Just the gentleman, just to the left of Robert, final question. Yeah, my name is uh, Roger Mansa. I wanted to focus on really on grassroots training. It hasn't really been talked too much about um, in the rural areas, in agriculture. I mean, obviously local groups know that weather is changing. Um, and are negatively affected by that, by the floods, by droughts, uh, by loss of uh, woods and everything like that. But in terms of the responses to that, uh, my experience is that they will need some training, some support in terms of new crops to grow or new types of um, uh, vegetables to grow. But all that needs to be talked about. So we don't, shouldn't just be thinking at the top level, we need to be thinking also at the bottom level, at the very grassroots. And I'm talking about villages, I'm talking about small regions, um, and areas like that. So I want to just say, to balance all this policy talk with a bit of grassroots stuff, that's all. Thank, thank you very much. Um, so there's two questions there. Um, and I want to add one of my own, and then I want to invite um, panellists to respond to each and all of them if they can, just in the final closing remarks. One on higher education from Robert Dufton, there's other people from higher education here, so it's a very interesting um, line of thought there. One on grassroots training um, and what can be done there. Um, and Joan, that might be particularly of interest to you. And then the final question for me, I think I'd be remiss as chairing this debate, but to bring up the issue of divestment, um, which is one of the largest collaborations of foundations and others that have come together to call for divestments from fossil fuel companies. Of course, others have talked about the importance of engaging with shareholders and be helpful to have the reflections from panelists here about discussions that they've had with the people they work with and what, what their views 
might be. Who would like to uh, go first? I'm going to you first. Yeah, uh, that's actually what we're doing. The, the, the Google Drive is building up the uh, resilience of, of indigenous communities uh, in terms of, of adaptation and, and mitigation. And, and one of the, the things that we've learned is that the, the exchange, the cross-learning is actually very important uh, when, when you exchange different uh, indigenous communities within country and across country where, where they, they learn from each other. And, and it takes the amount of their feeling of isolation that they're dealing this alone. And so it builds further solidarity and how they can cooperate. Like even the knowledge, the, the, the use of traditional knowledge is critical in, in building uh, resilience of, of, of communities. And by sharing those traditional knowledge and, and the innovations that has come out uh, from it is, 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 is very important. So that's, that's I think, where uh, uh, philanthropies should also put more attention to this uh, uh, the, 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 the direct support to, to the initiatives of, of, of communities, but also the interlearning um, amongst these uh, this, uh, this communities. So, and, and yeah, the, I, just to, to plug on the critical importance of, of research, uh, and, and this has been, uh, has contributed, if you have scientific, they call scientific evidence, but also how traditional knowledge has been in, increasingly already mainstream, is also because uh, the, scientific, the scientific community has already acknowledged that uh, 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 traditional knowledge is, is key to find the, uh, to climate change uh, solutions. So if, if this is more uh, mainstream, so to speak, and, and supported, uh, especially in, in, in replication and in replicating uh, sustainable solutions to climate change, that it will go a long way. So, research is definitely a critical element also in, in the way we address uh, climate change. Yeah, everything she said. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I would just say from a grant making perspective, um, we want to be able to reach those communities, but we also have limited staff capacity, and so making 100 grants versus 10 means a lot. And so Oak does end up working through intermediaries as well as doing direct grant making. And finding organizations that can reach the grassroots, I mean global grant grants for example, reach the grassroots but have a broader network like Jones group are important, but you really have to screen them carefully because not all intermediaries have the same relationships on the ground and the social license to work with these communities. So that's sort of the filter I often think about when I'm, you know, how many grants can I make in a year and you know, who's going to help me do this in a way that it will be effective. So that was just, grassroots is obviously vitally important, but there's this sort of the plumbing <laughs> How, how, how you move that money to get there is, is important. Um, I'm, I guess the divestment question may have been directed <laughs> a little bit towards um, me just because, you know, Oak is a foundation, doesn't have an endowment, but we have an investment arm that, that um, where we get the money, where we can um, uh, do charitable giving. <laughs> and we are not um, uh, publicly a part of this divestment campaign. But um, because of our work in climate change, we do work with our um, investment team to make those investments as um, you know, clean and green as possible. And I believe that Oak was rated pretty high in a recent mapping that was done in terms of their investment portfolio. Um, but, but Oak is a foundation that tends not to be in the public eye so much, generally speaking, on the issues we work on, and so, so yeah, we're not going to be out in front on that particular um, issue, but I think you're right. That divestment investment committee has been a huge galvanizer for philanthropic um, dollars to like work together towards a common goal. So, thank you. Thanks very much, Florence. Right. And um, I think there are sort of four pillars of what foundations focus on and, and should and can focus on, and one of them is grant making. One of them is investment. One of them is convening power, yeah. bringing your grantees together and bringing people across sectors together. And then the fourth one is influencing. And I think, um, first of all, yes, I'd love to hear more about how the members of EFN can start, help um, 
influence that program. Uh, in terms of divest invest, that's sort of investments and influencing, because the goal is not just to simply remove funding from the fossil fuel industry, uh, the goal is to um, have high profile organisations that are respect, well respected to do it, uh, so that it has a sort of knock on effect on the ability of these, these industries to maintain their political power, so removing their social licence. Um, the movement, the divestment movement as a whole, has well over 500 organisations that have signed on to it, with 3.4 trillion dollars in uh, assets under management, which is enormous. Um, but it's a much smaller subset that have committed to divest, invest, and I think it's really critical that the invest side does not get lost in the conversation around it. We have to be putting the funding into the transition, the energy transition. So I'm. Um, I'm really hopeful more foundations will get on board with that. What are you, what are you shaking your head for, Roger? It was the energy side that you mentioned, the or the investment. It should be generally investment, not just energy. Energy, and then yeah. sort of climate solutions. Climate side. Solutions. Yeah, sure, no, I agree, I agree with that. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, especially, obviously, when it comes to climate justice, that, as, that, act, that aspect of it is really important. And the climate, uh, the energy access part of it is really important. And that's somehow getting forgotten a bit in conversations around divestment. Um, that's all I would say. Thank you. I appreciate um, your willingness to comment. That's probably the one issue that has generated most debate following the um, publication of the magazine was, uh, was this issue around divestment and where foundations and others stand or should stand in relation to it. Um, just uh, leaves me to say a few thank yous. Um, first of all, to all of you for coming. Um, you mentioned convening the opportunity to convene such debates to hopefully reflect on some of the issues and then move forward on this other and try to offer an alliance. Um, we would invite you, um, if you've been interested or inspired uh, by anything you've heard today, to <laughs> tell colleagues to subscribe if you don't already, and also to uh, submit letters where we have some space for uh, reflections on this edition to be published in the 6th of September in our September edition. And on the September edition, we will be moving from the last three editions, which are focused on SDGs, refugees and migration, and climate change, back into the zone of philanthropy, asking about whether philanthropy has too much or not enough power. Uh, that will be the focus of September and then in December, looking at climate, uh, uh, community philanthropy uh, and uh, communities of philanthropy and the way that community foundations and community uh, philanthropy has been reformed. So look out for that. Um, just of course, I'd like to thank my colleagues at Alliance and Holly and Sam over here for organising today. Um, and the Oak Foundation in particular for partnering um, with us and for being a long standing uh, sponsor of the Alliance. Thank you. Thank you to Oak. It's great to have your partnership. And, Thanks to Anne, to Joan, and to Florence for your excellent, exceptional contributions today. I really hope we'll be revisiting this issue with more resources, more philanthropic resources being focused on climate philanthropy and justice, uh, issues of social justice at least being um, uh, increasingly central to the debate. So uh, we'll have refreshments outside. Uh, looking forward to connecting with you there. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming today. Thank you.